how do you, from the scientific perspective, go from knowing nothing about the disease to going, you said, uh, to, to going through the entire pipeline and actually have a drug or, or a treatment that cures that disease? So that's an enormously long path and an enormously great challenge. And what I'm trying to argue is that it progresses in stages of understanding rather than one gene at a time. The traditional view of biology was you have one postdoc working on this gene and another postdoc working on that gene. And they'll just figure out everything about that gene. And that's their job. What we've realized is how polygenic the diseases are. So we can't have one postdoc per gene anymore. We now have to have these cross-cutting needs. And I'm gonna describe the path to circuitry along those needs. And every single one of these paths, we are now doing in parallel across thousands of genes. So the first step is you have a genetic association. And we talked a little bit about sort of the Mendelian path and the polygenic path to that association. So the Mendelian path was looking through families to basically find gene regions and ultimately genes that are underlying particular disorders. The polygenic path is basically looking at unrelated individuals in this giant matrix of genotype by phenotype, and then finding hits where a particular variant impacts disease all the way to the end. And then we now have a connection, not between a gene and a disease, but between a genetic region and a disease. And that distinction is not understood by most people. So I'm gonna explain it a little bit more. Why do we, do we not have a connection between a gene and a disease, but we have a connection between a genetic region and a disease? The reason for that is that 93% of genetic variants that are associated with disease don't impact the protein at all. So if you look at the human genome, there's 20,000 genes. There's 3.2 billion nucleotides. Only 1.5% of the genome codes for proteins. The other 98.5% does not code for proteins. If you now look at where are the disease variants located, 93% of them fall in that outside the genes portion. Of course, genes are enriched, but they're only enriched by a factor of three. That means that still 93% of genetic variants fall outside the proteins. Why is that difficult? Why is that a problem? The problem is that when a variant falls outside the gene, you don't know what gene is impacted by that variant. You can't just say, oh, it's near this gene. Let's just connect that variant to the gene. And the reason for that is that the genome circuitry is very often long range. So you basically have that genetic variant that could sit in the intron of one gene. And an intron is sort of the, the place between the exons that code for proteins. So proteins are split up into exons and introns, and every exon codes for a particular subset of amino acids, and together they're spliced together and then make the final protein. So that genetic variant might be sitting in an intron of a gene. It's transcribed with the gene, it's processed and then excised, but it might not impact this gene at all. It might actually impact another gene that's a million nucleotides away. So it's just riding along, even though it has nothing to do with the with this nearby neighborhood. That's exactly right. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Oh, man. The strongest genetic association with obesity was discovered in this FTO gene, fat and obesity associated gene. So this FTO gene was studied ad nauseum. People did tons of experiments on, on it they figured out that FTO is in fact a RNA methylation transferase. It basically, cre it, it sort of impacts something that we know, that we call the epitranscriptome. Just like the genome can be modified, the transcriptome, the transcript of the genes can be modified. And we basically said, oh great, that means that, that epitranscriptomics is hugely involved in obesity because that, that gene FTO is, is you know, uh, clearly where the genetic locus is at. My group studied FTO in collaboration with, you know, a wonderful team uh, led by Melina Klausnitzer. And what we found is that this FTO locus 
even though it is associated with obesity, does not implicate the FTO gene. The genetic variant sits in the first intron of the FTO gene, but it controls two genes, IRX3 and IRX5, that are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away, several genes away. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so what am I supposed to feel about that? Because isn't that like super complicated then? Uh, so, so the way that I was introduced at a conference a few years ago was, uh, and here's Manolis Kellis who wrote the most depressing paper of <laughs> 2015. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the entire pharmaceutical industry was so comfortable that there was a single gene in that locus. Because in some loci, you basically have three dozen genes that are all sitting in the same region of association. And you're like, oh gosh, which ones of those is it? But even that question of which ones of those is it is making the assumption that it is one of those, as opposed to some random gene just far, far away, which is what our paper showed. So basically what our paper showed is that you can't ignore the circuitry. You have to first figure out the circuitry, all of those long range interactions, how every genetic variant impacts the expression of every gene in every tissue imaginable across hundreds of individuals. And then you now have one of the building blocks, not even all of the building blocks, for then going and understanding disease. So, okay. So, so embrace the, the wholeness of the circuitry. Correct. But what, 